All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us in this Zoom room um, at this training. This is Know Your Rights for Supportive Housing Tenants, uh, hosted by NAMI NYC, the National Alliance on Mental Illness of New York City. And we're really excited to have you here. This event is being recorded. It will also be live streamed to Facebook um, starting shortly. Uh, so just everybody is aware. Um, para hispano hablante, por favor, hacen clic en el globo en la parte inferior de la pantalla y selecciona español para oír la interpretación en vivo en español. Y si necesitan ayuda, por favor, piden ayuda en el chat y yo les puedo ayudar cuando termino la introducción. Y también es necesario a tocar donde dice silenciar audio original para solo escuchar al interprete. Um, we also have ASL interpretation. Um, and I've just put a message in the chat for anyone who's using it. Um, our current interpreter is ASL interpreter Kimberly and um, ASL interpreter Chad will be switching <coughs> off. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, they, we're getting a little bit of background noise. So I am going to um, just mute folks. Great. Um, okay, so um, I can see that we are live on Facebook now. Um, sorry for the delay. Hello to everybody joining us on Facebook. Thank you for being here. Um, we're really excited to have you here this evening. Um, I, my name is Clara and I'm going to be introducing our speakers um, and then uh, moderating uh, later on. Um, again, we're getting a little bit of background noise, so I'm going to go ahead and mute everyone. Okay. Um, always something, always something. <laughs> um, so as I said, this event is hosted by NAMI NYC, the National Alliance on Mental Illness of New York City. So before I turn it over to our speakers, I'm going to say a few words. Um, about NAMI NYC. Um, we are a grassroots mental health organization. Um, our mission is to provide support, education, and advocacy to individuals and families impacted by mental illness. And what that means right now is free virtual classes and support groups and other services, both for people living with mental health issues and for anybody supporting someone living with a mental health issue. All of our classes and groups are facilitated by volunteers who themselves are living with a mental health issue or are supporting someone who is. So this is what we mean when we say peer led. Um, I could say more, but I do want to leave plenty of time for our speakers this evening and for Q&A. We will be saving questions until the end but we do really encourage folks to put questions in the chat, uh, questions and comments um, in the chat so that we can take note of them and try to answer them if we can in the chat as we go along, but for more involved questions, we'll save those to the end so that we can answer them in more depth. Um, okay, I think, uh, I think I've covered most of the, uh, logistical things that we need to cover. Um, I'm just going to put um, our interpretation note in the chat one more time. Um, and, um, oh, and the last thing I do wanna say um, is that if you want to know more about NAMI NYC services, um, please always feel free to visit our website, which is naminyc.org, or call our helpline. Um, we just put the link to more information about the helpline in the chat as well, but that number um, is 212-684-3264. Um, or you can email us at helpline at namiNYC.org. And that's in the chat as well. Okay, so uh, without further ado, I really, I'm really pleased and excited to turn 
uh, this over to our speakers who will be facilitating this training. Um, Kat, uh, Michael A, and Michael K. Um, and they are all members of SHOUT, uh, or Supportive Housing Organizing, Organized and United Tenants, which is a supportive housing tenant and applicant-driven organization demanding dignity and rights. So we're really happy to welcome them for this training. Um, last quick thing, because I did see a question in the chat about this, um, we do not offer certificates or um, uh, any kind of attendance certificate for our public events. Um, thank you for that question. Please feel free to put further questions and comments in the chat as we go along. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to, um, I believe, Michael A is kicking us off or possibly Kat. Go ahead and unmute yourselves. Okay, um, I can start off. Um, so hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Anderson. My pronouns are he and him. I have lived in scattered site supportive housing for homeless people living with a mental illness diagnosis since 2008. My diagnosis is bipolar disorder and PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. I have a master's in social work from Hunter College, Silverman School of Social Work. I have worked as a peer advocate helping homeless people living with mental illness apply for housing by completing the HRA 2010E. I've been a volunteer for the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI, this chapter, New York City Metro affiliate since 2006. And I've been a community organizer for SHOUT since April of last year. I will be sharing my experiences as a tenant in supportive housing um, unfortunately, I cannot share the name of the supportive housing provider, which I am housed with. Uh, over to you, Kat. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Kat, uh, she, her pronouns. I have been in supportive housing for a little over two years. Um, I live in, um, I have to actually look at one of the slides to explain what type of housing I'm in, but um, unlike Michael's, it's not scattered sites. It's um, they're all in the same um, building, which I'm really not happy with, but um, it's uh, different for sure. Um, I'm really looking to um, hopefully experience a different, more integrative type of housing. But um, I have um, a background in, um, ironically, like counseling psychology before I moved to New York. And when I moved to New York, I found out that I wasn't going to be able to use it in New York State. Um, but during the past two years of COVID, um, I was able to start get, getting trained in peer advocacy. Um, so now I am a peer advocacy through the Academy of Peer Services. Um, and looking at some of the questions that are popping up, we are going to be talking about this in our presentation. Um, one of the things you'll hear about, too, is my um, emotional support animal lucky. So that's one of the areas that I am um, have crossed paths with becoming an expert in. So. Uh, one of the avenues of supportive housing, um, and I will pass it on to Michael Kay. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Michael. Um, yes, he, him pronouns, and uh, let's see. I'm. Uh, I've been. Uh, in, in, you know, I, I've been in, back. Here. <laughs> I don't even know where to begin. Uh, I've. Uh, I. I been suffering from a bipolar two disorder for many, 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 many decades, I think at this point. And finally, thank goodness I got under some sort of medication in the mid 2000s and I'm on track um, somewhat. Uh, I also have anxiety disorder, which is gonna come, come through loud and clear. And <laughs> that's for sure. And I, and I, you know, I, I'm someone who like I'm a college dropout that's been involved in political things back and forth, up and down from many different angles. Uh, latest thing was basically the Bernie Sanders campaign, which I worked uh, in 2016 and 2020. 
yeah, I've been involved with uh, other uh, issues. Uh, ACT UP at one point, at one time. That was kind of a late stage version. The, the wasn't there, uh, the rock and roll version was a little late. Um, uh, there was, and other organizations and other uh, um, things. Um, but I, yeah, I'd rather not uh, uh, belabor you guys with my, uh, my personal stuff. And uh, yeah, um, do we need to, um, all right, so we, should we move on to the next slide, I believe? I think, yes. So, um, all right, so let's see. Um, I'm going to read this one. Uh, 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 the, all right, so tonight's uh, event, if everything goes well, we should be uh, uh, done within a little over an hour, maybe, if we're lucky. Uh, what is supportive housing? That should take five minutes. History of supporting housing, that's 10. Uh, accessing uh, supportive housing, that's another 10. Uh, laws and regulations that apply to supportive housing, that's 10 more. Uh, and then tenants' rights in supportive housing, the rights and realities, that's a half hour. And then we'll do a question and answer session, that's for, that's for 10 minutes. And then we all go home happy. OK, <laughs> hopefully. All right. So, uh, yeah, let's move on to number four and take it away, Michael, I believe. All right. Um, thank you, Michael. Um, yep. So just, uh, we wanted to include a slide about language considerations. Um, some of the labels that are used by the supportive housing industry include chronically homeless, mentally ill, serious mental illness, chemically addicted, and uh, substance abuse disorder. So we wanted to point out that um, for many people, these are stigmatizing terms, and it's important to um, defer to a tenant for what they wish to be called and how they wish to describe their situation. For example, using person-first language, people experiencing, I sometimes um, say that I'm a mental health consumer, that works for me, or I'm somebody living with bipolar disorder, at the same time, we wanted to point out that some of these terms, chronically homeless, mentally ill, serious mental illness, do appear on applications for um, supportive housing. So you kind of have to sometimes use the terms um, whether or not you, you um, feel they're stigmatizing or not. So they're necessary terms, but it's also important to know that there, that there are alternatives. Uh, I guess we can move on to, yeah, great. Um, so what is supportive housing? Um, to get us started, uh, we just wanna give a broad definition. So supportive housing is housing, and we'll get more into um, the description of permanent housing or transitional housing, but it's housing with supportive services in theory. And um, I can give a, a, a little, um, a few examples from my own experience of what that means. What are these uh, sometimes called wraparound services? So support services can include or, or should include case management, also educational or vocational and other recovery oriented services, medication management and counseling, assistance in gaining access to government benefits, referrals to medical services, mental health care and treatment for drug and alcohol use and recommendations for other needed services such as legal support. And I've um, received all of these uh, in the supportive housing program that I'm in. It's very important, we wanna point, and also we say in theory, because uh, that's what we, we want people to have those supportive services, but not everybody gets them. Um, it's also important to point out that, these, that supportive housing is not homeless shelters, like uh, cluster site shelters. And it's also not a catch-all permanent housing solution for all people experiencing homelessness. So we can move on, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna just talk a little bit about the history of supportive housing. So if you look at this timeline from 1950 to 1980, um, from 1950 to 1980, so when and why did supportive housing take off in New York City? So all the way back to 1950, um, began the deinstitutionalization of the New York State psychiatric facilities. There were no adequate provision of community treatment. There was a mass migration to SROs, single room occupancy um, units as one of the few low cost housing options for people of extremely low income. From 1970 to 1980, there was accelerated conversions of single room occupancy SRO housing. 
There was a loss of about 81,000 units between 1977 and 1981, and a 43% decrease in units renting at or below $200. Also, there was no right to shelter until 1981. So to continue with what, when and why did supportive housing take off in New York City? Um, as a result of that previous slide, there were more people in poverty. There was an increase in people living with mental illness in New York City communities and a decrease in available housing opportunities, escalating street homelessness. So from 1980 to 1990, we had the first supportive housing models take off in New York City primarily converting SRO, single room occupancy housing, into a housing first model for people experience, experiencing serious mental illness. And I'll just mention a little bit about the housing first model. So when we say the housing first model, it's a model of housing, which is based on the belief that people should be able to access housing, even when they are struggling with one or more issues that may make it difficult to stabilize or maintain that housing. For example, addiction, disability, mental health conditions, et cetera. That contrasts with the housing ready approach in which people only get connected to housing when they demonstrate sobriety, stability, and are ready to maintain an apartment. So supportive housing is part and parcel of the housing first model because people are generally not required to be sober or stable, et cetera, to access housing. Um, so I just wanted to, to point that out. Um, so I guess we can move on to the next slide. Okay, expansion of the supportive housing model. So these numbers are really important. Um, wh while there are 50,000 uh, supportive housing units in all of New York State, there are uh, 35,000 in New York City alone. So 50,000 in the whole state, 35,000 units in New York City. Um, there's an estimated 50,000 to 70,000 people living in supportive housing in New York City. Um, and there's also an expanded eligibility for supportive housing, which includes youth aging out of foster care, veterans, frequent Medicaid users, and many others not traditionally associated with the model. The critique is that for many years, Supportive housing was the only viable housing option for homeless New Yorkers. As a result, many more people were assessed and found eligible than likely otherwise would have been referred to supportive housing. And tenants in supportive housing are extremely diverse, including in terms of what supportive services they need or want. There is no one size fits all as Kat uh, brought up previously, where we're all different, even though we are all tenants. So um, to move on to the eligibility and access to supportive housing, we're not going to go into the, um, uh, you know, the how to apply for supportive housing. We ask that you and um, you'll be you'll get these um, links in the follow up email. But if you're interested in learning how to apply or fill out an application for supportive housing, um, we want we we want you to call the NAMI helpline. Um, or any of the other resources that you'll be getting in your in a follow up email after this, um, uh, probably tomorrow or in the following days. But just so we know that in order to get house, uh, supportive housing, one needs to fill out an HRA applic application and it must be approved. Um, in order to do this, a client must complete or a person must complete what is called an HRA form 2010E. Uh, formerly single point of access SPOA, and I'll go into that in a little bit. Um, as part of that, a psychiatric evaluation needs to be filled out, as well as a psychosocial assessment. A psychiatric evaluation would be filled out by a psychiatrist. A psychosocial assessment is typically filled out by a social worker or a therapist. Um, there's an application and supporting documents uh, system. So once once the, the package is ready for application, these um, supporting documents are submitted to something called the PACT system, which stands for Placement Assistance and Client Tracking System. Um, any entity with access to PACT can submit a 2010E application, including a shelter provider, a street outreach connection, a hospital or psychiatric treatment facility, 
a post-incarceration placement program, an at-risk youth clinic or community-based organization. In my own case, I was um, in a hospital, a psychiatric hospital for three months um, before I was placed into um, supportive housing. Also, a lot of these details that, that we're sharing, um, you would be working with um, a help or somebody, a social worker or somebody who would be helping you fill out the application. So don't worry too much about the details. Once the application has been approved, um, the second part is going through the interview process and matching with a supportive housing organization that is right um, for you that, that wants to have you in their program. I just wanted to um, also point out that um, the SPOA is a little confusing and since we included it in the slide, um, the SPOA stands for um, Supportive Housing uh, is Single Point of Access, excuse me. The SPOA stands for Single Point of Access. And under the SPOA program, consumers with special service needs may be eligible to receive OMH, Office of Mental Health, New York State, funded enhanced services, thereby increasing the likelihood that they will be accepted into a housing program. In addition, SPOA guarantees the consumer will be interviewed by all SPOA referred housing providers. SPOA will significantly expand information available about who is getting access and who is not getting access to mental health housing. So um, when you're doing your research on this, further research on this, make sure to look into the single point of access system. And we also wanna point out that's really important is that you know, there's, there's the application and, and then there's the realities to um, applying and also not um, being accepted when you apply for supportive housing. Um, this, can, this can be, you know, in order to get your psychiatric evaluation, your psychosocial, to meet with a social worker or whoever's gonna be filling out your application. Sometimes people don't even have the um, MetroCard or car fare in order to get to all of those appointments. So it's very important that that lack of material support can keep people from getting to where they need to go in order to fill out the application and, and fill out the, um, and get um, approved for supportive housing. Also evaluations and approvals like the psychosocial and psyche eval, they expire. So some of them expire in six months, some of them expire in a year. And sometimes um, it's like juggling, you know, uh oh, this, this uh, document is gonna be expiring in three months. And if we don't get a new one, it's gonna ruin the whole application uh, process. Also um, many rejections, if you look to the right of this slide, you'll see examples of why some, of the, some people are rejected for not um, uh, in, in rejected from supportive housing or rejected from a, a provider of supportive housing. Um, it's very important that this term creaming refers to um, the stigma in the interview process. So somebody um, may be rejected for supportive housing because they are too high functioning or they have a lack of insight into their mental illness or they um, are living with um, substance use issues. And so the creaming is kind of like, we'll, we'll take the people that we think are gonna be best for our program, but um, rejecting other people, um, not for uh, uh, the proper reasons. Also, there's no appeal process in uh, currently for the supportive housing rejections. And also there's no reasonable accommodations for supportive housing matching, which we will get to in a, in a further slide. Okay, I think that's um, Kat, I think it's up to you, yeah. So we have different types of supportive housing. Um, two main categories are transitional and permanent. Um, the transitional housing are um, where residents are expected to reside for generally up to two years, sometimes a little bit longer before they move to permanent housing. And then the permanent housings are the ones where tenants are um, reside permanently in their units unless they decide to move. Um, the transitional housing is what's considered licensed or level two housing. And the permanent housing is unlicensed or level one housing. Um, the licensed housing is what is also known as residential treatment programs. This is the congregate treatments or apartment treatment programs. 
They are bound by agency regulations. Um, this includes the right to receive a lease or occupancy agreements, agency protocols around discharge or termination, right to participants in what is called resident councils. Um, there are other key tenant rights that, um, oh, okay, so the key tenant rights like rights to guests can be curtailed in occupancy agreements. Sometimes these are, um, uh, like you can only have a guest on the weekends or you can only have guests until eight o'clock at night. Um, everyone, there's usually they are like very, very site specific and they, I think I have yet to see any of them be um, the same. They change every time I run into a different um, treatment program. Um, like you have to like uh, sign in everywhere. You have to have your like, it's almost like a permission slip to have someone come over, they have to be approved, things like that. Um, so they are again, very site specific. Um, on the permanent unlicensed level one sites, they are what are considered permanent housing. They are um, often designated supported housing. Um, they can become, or they can also be titled congregated supported housing or scattered site supported housing. Agency guidelines are non-binding. These units should be subject to all state and local laws governing housing rights. I'm trying to see. Um, so the question is, how do I know what kind of housing program I live in? And typically the scattered site housing programs are unlicensed level one permanent housing programs. However, some scattered site models, specifically apartment treatment programs, are licensed level two transitional programs. Uh, the New York State Office of Mental Health, or OMH, you might hear, maintains a searchable directory of all licensed level two programs on its websites, and the website address is listed below. Um, And then how do I know what kind of supportive housing program I am in? Additionally, your occupancy agreements or lease may indicate whether it is a treatment program, licensed tier two, or a supported program, which is also known as permanence. Um, your rent amounts is another clue. It may indicate whether it is a licensed tier two program which means the program fees or personal needs allowance or a scattered site supported program, which is when the rent is set at 30% of your income. Contracts between the agency and provider may indicate the type of program the unit is under. Shout collects contracts for supportive housing providers. And when in doubt, reach out. You can reach out and ask um, for help in getting copies of like the types of agreements or to get a copy of your contract to try and find out information about um, like what your lease is or what your agreement is. Um, if they haven't given you a copy to keep, you can ask for a copy and that should say on it what type of program it is um, just so you know more information. And then this one is Michael Korn. Okay, hi there. Uh, yes, uh, number 14, it's uh, tenancy structures and supportive housing. These are different types of uh, lease agreements, I guess. Um, direct lease is a tenant or tenants receive a lease with the building owner and it's the arrangement advocated for in the New York State Office of Mental Health Guidelines. Uh, that's ideal. Uh, the second is a sublease, fairly common in scattered site models. Provider holds a direct lease or a master lease with the building owner for one or more units in the building. Tenants hold a sublease or an occupancy agreement with the provider. Uh, a third is a roommate shares. In some cases, one tenant may hold a lease or sublease for the unit while the remaining tenants do not. Not ideal for those who do not, right? <clears throat> Anyway, and the last one is uh, no lease. Uh, in many cases, supportive housing residents do not receive an occupancy agreement or a lease from the provider. However, they do pay rent in exchange for occupancy of the premises 
entitling them to tenancy status. And the next slide, uh, tenants rights in support of housing, uh, statement of principles, anyone living in permanent supportive housing unit is a tenant with all the rights and privileges of tenants under New York City and New York State law. Uh, tenancy rights should be strengthened for all supportive housings, permanent or transitional. Uh, yeah, this last uh, 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 session of the uh, city council, uh, uh, the uh, Bill of Rights was passed, uh, intro 2176 was a Bill of Rights was passed and now it's local law 15. And that is uh, uh, given us uh, 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 more uh, uh, pr uh, rights and uh, yeah, if you look up a local law 15 of night uh, 2022, uh, that'll tell you all your rights that um, have been given from that uh, uh, that piece of legislation. Uh, all right, the acknowledgement of complexity, uh, supporting housing providers and New York judges have taken mixed stances regarding whether supporting housing tenants are tenants. That's still up uh, in the air. Uh, licensed support apartment treatment programs are transitional and therefore may not be entitled to all the tenancy rights of all supportive housing tenants. So I guess you have to, you know, um, look at your uh, each individual program because they vary in that case. Uh, acknowledgement of reality, even when supportive housing tenants are recognized as tenants under law, enforcing rights in supportive housing is more difficult for these tenants uh, than others. Uh, next uh, slide, uh, protections from eviction. Uh, the law says supportive housing tenants are entitled to all due process rights available to tenants uh, facing eviction, including notice, court process, and a right to counsel uh, attorney. Uh, a provider discharge or termination from a supportive housing program is not the same as an eviction. Tenants are entitled to for, full court process. Uh, yeah, uh, residents in licensed supportive housing are also entitled to additional layers of process as defined in the provider contracts and agency, OMH, that's Office of Mental Health, DOHMH, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, et cetera, guidelines. <clears throat> a tenant in permanent supportive housing cannot be involuntarily transferred from one unit to another against their will. And that's where I wanted to mention a story. I have a, uh, a situation uh, that I was evicted. All right. Uh, I was trying to, I was, I was evicted. I was, they attempted to, um, I'm sorry, I'm very nervous tonight. Uh, they, uh, that, um, all right, I'm just going to read you off a script because that's what I wrote out and this is the best way I can do it. Sorry about this folks. All right, here it is. I call it my, I, my ICL story. That's the Institute for Community Living. That's the supportive housing program that's uh, providing me with housing. But this is what they try to run on me, okay? So here it is. Uh, my caseworker from the Institute for Community Living, Inc., uh, paid me a visit one afternoon back in December 20th, uh, uh, December 2020. And she was as lovey-dovey as she could be when she informed me that I'd have to move. Uh, <clears throat> And yeah, I'm sorry. She, she explained to me in comforting tones that she and her supervisor had tried their damnness to keep me housed in my apartment, but to no avail. She made it seem that they were really, really on my side, but then she dropped the but. We tried everything, but the program for individuals living in their own apartments has ended. Then she smiled, looked at me directly in the eye, and with a twisted little smile said, I'm sorry, Michael, but you have no choice. Well, that rankled my ass. So, hmm. yes, so uh, I didn't know what to do. I was so twisted and sure of, of my rights that I started to believe it was true. I almost gave up and gave in, all right? Uh, they wanted to move me into a shared apartment uh, a smack dab in the middle of the uh, COVID lockdown knowing that I have chronic shortness of breath and sleep apnea, among other, among other comorbidities. And the, uh, the building itself was run by a slum ward uh, who was on pu uh, public advocate Tish James's 100 worst landlords list in 2016 and also in 2018. 
He's a real striver, right? Uh, also, there was a rent strike at the building when we uh, and when we went to ch- uh, yeah when we went to check it out. Uh, that would have made me a scab if I took that apartment. So yeah, it's nice people, right? Anyway, thank goodness I was put in contact with uh, uh, a lawyer from the Mobilization for Justice who successfully kept me in my apartment. Thanks, Sandra Gressel. Uh, so ICL is a slogan, all right, which says people get better with us. And sometimes they have a funny way of showing it, right? Um, So I'd like to uh, share my own personal slogan. You're good until you're not. Meaning that you need to know that you have rights as a tenant that no supporting housing provider or landlord can take away from you. Don't let them them run a line of bullshit on you. Thanks. Uh, Next slide. And... Uh, let's see, and that's number 17, sorry. Uh, reality, uh, let's see, many, wait a minute, sorry about that. <laughs> Protections from eviction, uh, no. I lost my spot. Okay, sorry, reality, many tenants are not informed of these rights or made aware of, of available protections. Uh, tenants are informed or believe that program discharge equals eviction. Tenants are told they will lose their housing if they refuse to accept the transfer. Uh, yeah, so the strategy would be that, that you request copies of all provider discharge termination protocols uh, and uh, access to a right to counsel attorney in case of involuntary transfer, discharge, or eviction. I'm glad in my case, I'm glad it didn't go there. But, you know, anyway. Uh, Number 18, we'll hand that over to Kat, I believe, or back over. Uh, Right to repairs. Um, The law is that tenants in support of housing have the right to obtain repairs. Um, For example, calling 311 or initiating an HP case in housing courts. Tenants who pay a portion of their rents may withhold rent to obtain repairs. Providers who may cooperate with such a claim by withholding rent subsidies until repairs are provided. Under the New York City Human Rights Law, tenants cannot receive fewer services or repairs than other tenants on the basis of their source of income or disability status. In reality, many scattered site supportive housing units are in buildings operated by irresponsible landlords. The supportive housing tenants are told to direct all repair issues to the supportive housing provider rather than calling 311 or the landlord. Providers then report the repairs to the landlord or attempt to make them themselves. Uh, There is a threat of retaliation against the tenant or the supportive housing provider. Supportive housing providers are reluctant to enforce their rights or, because they are at risk of losing leases. Um, and then tenants have to compromise on repairs or DIY repairs. Um, yeah, I just came back from a two week um, temporary placement because I had a flood that took over a year of building up because my landlord did not want to fix it. Um, They could have put my stuff in a temporary storage facility for a month to like fix the leak. And they decided, no, they weren't going to do that because that would have cost them money. And so um, I ended up, or just like, A, the building is poorly built to begin with, thanks to like subcontractors. And so it's a new building, so it's not even an old building. But to save money, they didn't want to have to pay for putting my stuff in storage for even a month. And 12 months later, we ended up having a busted pipe that flooded my entire apartment, flooded my two neighbors' apartments, and the water ended up leaking to the first floor and the elevator machine room. And so I don't even want to know how much it's going to go. Well, I, I kind of do want to know how much it's going to cost them because it's going to it's going to cost more than putting stuff in storage for one month would have cost. 
So, um, but that's just an example of how the supportive housing provider did not do it correctly. They did not do it efficiently, and it ended up is going to cost them a lot of money. Besides all it took from me for the past two weeks, but um, some strategies for people that end up having this situation again, because I know I'm not going to be the only one partnering with local organizing groups, um, partnering with proactive providers and case managers. Um, like, for instance, my housing provider did not want to do anything to help me. And then having one of the main, in my opinion, I usually say about five organizations are helping Shout be who Shout is. And one was on a phone call with me with my housing provider um, to let them know that they have got to get their crap together. Um, because they were pretending that they did not see holes in the wall when they were saying I had to move back in. Like, I really have to move back in while I still have holes in my wall. And I literally took my phone and zoomed in on the holes in the wall. And they were like, oh, maybe we need to fix those first. So like, literally this is happening. Um, so always having a witness and an advocate helps us, you know, get stuff accomplished. Um, so definitely having witnesses, helps us um, get our voice louder and like logic injected into our housing providers. Um, the right to organize um, a law. Tenants in support of housing have the right to organize on any issue, including joining a tenants association with other tenants. Um, an example is organizing in the building's common areas and private units. This right cannot be infringed upon by a supportive housing provider or landlord. Um, in the past, we've heard examples of landlords that, um, landlords or housing providers that wanted to be informed about this. They wanted to um, be notified when this was happening or that it was happening. Um, so you can either meet in, once in someone's apartment, you can meet outside like at a, Dunkin Donuts or a McDonald's or a Starbucks, you do not have to let them know. Um, sometimes they would say that they needed to be notified in order to open the room because the room is kept locked. Um, but the room may or may not have security cameras, so you may or may not want to be using the room in the building. Um, so just know that you have the right to organize, even if the housing provider says you have to ask permission first, you do not have to ask permission first. Um, next slide. Um, so the reality, tenants are misinformed about the right to organize or told they're not allowed to organize for the housing rights due to their program. Sometimes the tenants are retaliated against for organizing. Tenants are told to only organize in specific ways or specific places, maybe perhaps like a given time or a given day. Um, and the strategies, like I was mentioning at the last slide, to um, organize off-site or online even. Um, solidarity, support from outside organizing groups, um, building through existing resident council structures, perhaps. Um, I know one thing that I do mention to some people is um, before Shout became Shout, I used to volunteer with um, um oh i'm blanking on their name now um oh someone can help me um oh metropolitan housing so um anyway monday nights was always like a three-hour housing uh, meeting well before covid you know um oh met council on housing that's like their nickname and so that was who I used to always hang out with before COVID hit. Um, and so they had a lot of tenant organizations um, based on like zip code really. Um, and then I think it's, yeah, next slide. Um, protections from harassment, discrimination, and retaliation. 
uh, supportive housing tenants benefit from the same protections as any other tenant with respect to harassment, discrimination, and retaliation. That is the law. The reality is these rights can be difficult to enforce, especially without any paper trail or record. So strategies include documents, documents, and documents. Um, so these things can be put in writing. You can like take notes, keep a journal, uh, save emails and text messages, take photos, screenshots. One thing we emphasize as well is that New York is a one party recording state. So that means that it is possible to record such as with your cell phone. If you have the, if you have a cell phone that you can use to record things, um, you can record without the consent of the recorded party. Um, you can initiate, initiate a complaint with the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Um, they also have a pre-complaint intervention unit. Um, that was one way I was able to get some of my rights uh, handled, I guess you can say, within the shelter system, which was not supportive housing, but it's how I was able to get my um, emotional support animal situation handled in the shelter. Um, uh, you can also contact the New York State Office of Mental Health Customer Relations Line. And then you can contact the legal service, legal services office for support. Alrighty, and then this one I think is going to be both Michael and myself. So Michael, do you want to start, or Michael Anderson? Oh sure, sure. Um, okay, so um, just in talking about reasonable accommodations, um, we always start off with the law and then we will move into realities. So the law is that since many supportive housing tenants live with mental and or physical disabilities, they are entitled to reasonable accommodations under the New York City and New York State Human Rights Law and the Federal Fair Housing Act and or Americans with Disabilities Act. This can include the right to service animals or emotional support animals, the right to accessible housing, such as installation of ramps, working elevators, et cetera, and the right to transfer to a more suitable apartment as needed. The tenant is required to show that the reasonable accommodation is necessary and that there is a connection between the tenant's condition and the accommodation requested. The provider and or landlord must make the accommodation unless it can demonstrate that it is infeasible to do so. And um, before uh, Kat, Kat's gonna give some examples from her own experience, I just wanted to point out that I found out in my experience that um, taking antipsychotic medications makes me um, very um, sensitive to heat. So that would be something where I would um, you know, need to get a letter from my psychiatrist to say that I need air conditioning in my home or, or I need to be protected from um, too much heat exposure because of the medications that I'm tasting, taking. That would be an, a reasonable accommodation. Um, so uh, over to you, Kat. Um, so one example I had applying to housing is some supportive housing providers turn me down claiming that they, um, for scattered site in particular, they said that their providers did not allow animals on site. And that included service animals and emotional support animals, even though service animals are protected under the Americans with Disabilities Act and emotional support animals are protected under the Fair Housing Act. Um, so that was just like a miscommunication, but the the um, supportive housing provider did not want to sever ties with their landlords. They wanted to keep their you know keep the apartments they found and have a good relationship with the landlords. So they weren't willing to challenge it. They didn't want to mess with the legal system, um, and so. That was sort of like something that I ended up getting placed with a different provider that you know allowed emotional support animals and service animals because they just knew that that was the law and they they you know followed the law. Um, 
some other examples of reasonable accommodations are having like um you know shower bars put in your shower or um a bar put in the wall to help you get up or down from the toilet like grips to help extra support so there's other types of um accommodations you can request um but it's important to document what you requested and if they say yes and if they say no and if they say no but you know that it's like the incorrect answer you can contact those different four options that we suggested to challenge their refusal or denial of reasonable accommodations Okay, I think um, uh, this slide uh, talks about um, rights to guests, families, and roommates. Once again, we talk about the law, the reality, and strategies. So uh, permanent supportive housing tenants have all the same rights as other tenants under the roommate law. Permanent supportive housing tenants are entitled to guests, including overnight guests, irrespective of the house rules and their program. The reality is that supportive housing tenants are often told they cannot have roommates, guests, or family members, both verbally and in their leases. Tenants are often assigned roommates without any control over the selection process or choice in whether or not to live with others. Um, strategies, force the termination and litigate in housing court is one option to initiate a NYCCHR slash NYS HRC complaint for discrimination on basis of family status and for issues related to roommates, initiate a reasonable accommodation request if applicable or request a provider mediation or intervention. Um, and then just to talk a little bit about local law, which Michael um, Korn talked about earlier, um, this is something that um, was legislation that we worked on with in shout all of last year, um, which has now uh, become local law 15. Um, so it's a, a supportive housing tenants bill of rights. So it requires supportive housing programs to provide a notice of supportive housing tenants rights to all supportive housing tenants. The notice will include a clear explanation of supportive housing tenants rights, as well as essential information about the nature of their supportive housing program, including program staff contact information and the policies and regulations which impact their tenancies. And I'm just gonna um, read a little bit more about that. So local law 15 is also known as LL15. Um, this was a city council law that, that came into being last year. Um, it's also known as the Supportive Housing Tenants Bill of Rights. Um, B-O-R for short, and it's going to go into effect on May 9th of this year, and um, providers operating city con contracted supportive housing units will be required to provide the B-O-R to every, pr every prospective tenant at apartment viewing, lease renewal, and on demand, and a $250 penalty will be levied for each violation. So that's... Um, yeah, and then I think that's over to you, Michael, for um, why is it important to work with? Okay, <clears throat> yes. So as, as I'm going to piggyback off what Michael said, the, um, why is it important for tenants to organize? Because what Michael just said, because there wasn't a, um, uh, there wasn't a bill uh, to give people supportive housing uh, bill of rights. It wasn't there. It had to be advocated for, it had to be fought for. People had to uh, do a lot of lobbying to get this done. We were a part of it. Shot was a part of this. And um, the reason why um, we have this bill is because of that. Uh, so uh, to continue the fight, uh, you know, supportive housing tenants' rights are tenants' rights. Fighting for the rights of, our, of, of all supportive housing tenants strengthens the rights of all tenants by undercutting uh, loopholes that were there in past uh, ill, uh, you know, ill thought out legislation, I suppose. Uh, there's also racial economic dis disability justice, uh, and not to mention the solidarity that 
forms when people get together to stand up for themselves uh, and cutting through isolation because people who are um, in supportive housing, I'm one of those people that were um, isolated from other tenants in my support, uh, my scattered site housing. Uh, and yeah, so, uh, you know, with, with organizing and other, you know, getting together other supportive housing tenants and, 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 and advocating for themselves and fighting for themselves, uh, we should, you know, it, it will, it'll, it'll, it'll move us uh, closer to having a more uh, just society, right? Uh, the supportive housing tenant community has not been incorporated, uh, has not been incorporated into or actively excluded from housing rights spaces. So, uh, yeah. Um, so it says here, when we fought and uh, fought, we did win. That was intro 2176 was, which is local law 15 and 147, which is, it's called local law three. And that was a reporting bill that uh, actually makes, uh, it, it for, forces, I guess, it forces people to actually uh, aggregate all the reasons why people are, are given the rights to housing, are given housing or, or rejected from housing. So that way people can figure out where the, um, the, you know, the prejudice might be that's uh, holding people back from getting um, uh, properly placed. So that was uh, the, the 147 and some people called it the creaming bill. <laughs> All right, and uh, so uh, on to number 28. Uh, in 20, I'm like, I'm not sure if I'm looking at something. So, yeah, so uh, I'm looking at one more here barriers to organizing. Uh, that would be um, due to like, <laughs> there's a lot of stigma out there, and people need to uh, get past that. And, and just, uh, you know, I know it's e easy to say it, but. Whew, you know, we need to get past stigma because that's the main reason. I, I think one of the biggest reasons why we don't have more uh, housing, uh, homeless housing, and housing in general for people who are uh, in, uh, in 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 trouble, have have problems in their lives, is because people uh, look down upon people uh, with uh, with stigma. And I think we need to stand up and start saying. Nah, let's not uh, go there anymore. Let's uh, start uh, being more, um, uh, you know, just stand up a little straighter and, you know, taller and just not let people run over us and uh, realize that we can, uh, you know, overcome <laughs> these issues, but we have to work on it and we have to like not be uh, told we cannot. And uh, yeah. And uh, you know, is the you know, division and isolation of other tenants. There's a lack of access to uh, information about tenants' rights. Uh, there's a uh, active exclusion from organizing advocacy uh, uh, spaces. These are reasons why there are um, advocacy and organizing can't be done because there's a lot of retaliation, repression, misinformation by providers. Uh, they don't like it when you uh, stand up. Uh, they basically, you know, uh, lied to me and said, uh, my, my caseworker said my, uh, uh, the program for individual, um, apartments has ended and, uh, therefore I just had to, uh, move. And basically, I guess, um, I'm assuming because I never got a straight answer from them, but I think they lied to me, <laughs> you know? So, uh, you know, uh, cause they quietly, uh, um, uh, you know, um, um, quietly uh, uh, stopped uh, harassing me and told me I could have my uh, place and, uh, you know, just said, we're going to re-sign your lease, which I still haven't got yet, actually. But, um, <clears throat> and, you know, so there's all kinds of uh, uh, things, accessibility, technology, communication, mobility. There's other reasons why we don't have, uh, you know, um, access to stuff. Um, and, uh, well, last. uh and the last, last one, yeah, is those two. Um, huh, okay, yeah, so yeah, what was it saying? To, uh, okay, so yeah, the uh, because of those, um, 
all yeah, all these reasons. I'm sorry, I'm having a rough time tonight. Uh, I'm gonna what I didn't mention: systems focus organizing. What institutional actors can be brought in to ensure supportive housing tenants and all tenants that can, can live in safe, dignified, and accessible housing with the services supports necessary to thrive. Uh, yeah, that's what we're fighting for. Where appropriate, direct communication and collaboration with supportive housing providers and or sympathetic caseworkers can be helpful. Not every single one of them are horrors. Yes, yeah, so there's, there's some good people out there too. So you have to decide which ones are the right ones. And if they are good, work with them. Uh, it should always be done over the consent and involvement of tenants when you're um, you know, do, working with uh, the supportive housing uh, uh, hierarchy there. So uh, yeah, and you can also collaborate with us going forward and try to, uh, you know, uh, move more progressive uh, 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 legislation and uh, make sure our, our rights are not abridged. So uh, th thank you and uh, yeah, thanks a lot. And, uh, and if you wanna contact us, uh, got the information right there, take a look, count. Um, there's the number, got a Twitter account. And then NAMI has a, 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 a information as well. And uh, so, yeah, thanks. Thanks for everything. And uh, did you want to say anything, Michael or Kat, before we finish? Or before we go to question and answers? So I think uh, I can uh, pull, I can uh, bring up some of the questions that we have gotten in the chat. Um, as well as some questions um, that potentially some questions we may have some we may have time for some questions that were submitted ahead of time. Um, uh, so one question um, is there, which may apply to a number of people, is there an ombudsman uh, that can assist? with issues with supportive housing when the agency does not address it? What's like the central organization that addresses complaints or other issues, if there is one? I'm looking at Sandra, but I'm guessing that the, um, it would depend on the type of housing the person is in. And then that would be, you would need to call either the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene or the state's Office of Mental Health, um, because that would depend on like who your housing provider is. In my case, I have a housing through the New York State. And so even though I'm in New York City, when I did try to call the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, that's when I found out that I needed to call the Department of Health, which is the state level. And that that's the one that oversees my housing. Yes, Kat's exactly correct. If you live in housing that is operated or funded by the state, you would contact the New York State Office of Mental Health. And I am putting the complaint line information in the chat. And if you live in city funded housing, you could contact 311 to make a complaint with the city Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Now, a lot of tenants don't know if their housing is funded by the state or the city. So when in doubt, call both. And or if you contact OMH, the state's complaint line, they will transfer your complaint to the city if they um, look up your unit and see that your unit is funded by the city. So they do have a process in place to transfer the complaint to the city. So in doubt, you can contact the New York State OMH complaint line and I've included that information in the chat. Perfect. Um, I saw, Sandra, that you answered the question about whether Shout operates outside of New York City, which in the chat, and the answer is that unfortunately, it currently only operates in New York City in the five boroughs. Um, however, there was a question um, about if the, if the tenant's rights 
um, related to within supportive housing um, are the same across the boroughs, across different counties, or if those rights are different in different areas of New York State? That's a great question. So generally speaking, the rights we've reviewed today apply to tenants across New York State. If you live in an OMH licensed transitional housing program, that program is required to comply with state regulations. So those state regulations apply regardless of where in New York State you are. And similarly, the tenant rights that we reviewed for tenants in permanent supportive housing are based in state law. And can you clarify if OMH is federal or state? Yes, I just saw that question in the chat. Great question. OMH refers to the New York State Office of Mental Health. And so that is a state agency. Um, and I just want to quickly address, uh, somebody asked about whether the information that we've covered in the chat will be shared as well. The full chat, the full chat transcript will not be shared. We're going to try to kind of capture all of the information that's been shared in, um, in our follow-up email. But if you would like to save the chat, you can do that, um, with the, uh, there's, Right above where you type into the chat, there should be three dots. And um, on that menu, there should be a line that says save chat. And then you can save the chat yourself if you wanna just have that all to look at. Um, okay. Uh, will additional housing meetings be on the NAMI website? That's a, a great question. Um, I think, I believe that the answer is that they will be on the Shout website. Um, but if anyone wants to correct me on that, I can I accept corrections. Yes, Clara, thanks for, for asking. So I guess if the, the person asking the question is interested in similar presentations or trainings like this, they would be on the NAMI NYC a website, but if you are interested in attending a shout meeting to discuss issues in supportive housing and to connect with other tenants in supportive housing, then yes, meeting times are listed on the shout website and you can contact shout to get more information about when the next meeting will be. And are those meetings virtual or in person? Great question. Currently, they are all taking place by Zoom. You can log in through a device, or if you don't have access to a device, you can call in through a call-in number. Um, let's see. Uh, can we give some, okay, there are a couple of questions uh, coming up in the chat. Um, I, it would be great. Uh, I think this is a good one. Um, can, uh, could we sort of give a little bit of an overview of some of the legal assistant uh, options for legal assistance that uh, supportive housing tenants might have access to? Absolutely. So if you are facing eviction, um, then you should be referred by the court to what's called a right to counsel provider. Um, New York City implemented a right to counsel. So tenants in housing court facing eviction have the right to a court appointed attorney. However, for those of you who have been following the news, um, there's a huge challenge accessing those court appointed attorneys because the volume is so high that many legal services organizations are having to decline cases. That said, if you are already in a housing court case, you should ask the judge to be referred to a court appointed attorney. If you have questions regarding your rights as a tenant in supportive housing, if you're having issues with an apartment transfer, a reasonable accommodation issue, an emotional support animal issue, a rent calculation issue, or other um, legal issues that um, 
fall outside the scope of eviction, you can contact Mobilization for Justice's Mental Health Law Project. I'm an attorney at Mobilization for Justice's Mental Health Law Project, also called MHLP, and our intake line is 212-417-3830, and I will post that in the chat. You can also contact NAMI NYC's helpline to get referrals to other legal services organizations like Urban Justice Center, which is a SHOUT organizational ally member, or Take Root Justice, which again is a SHOUT organizational ally member, um, or other legal services organizations like Legal Aid or Legal Services of New York City. Perfect. Thank you, Sandra. Um, Yes, and if you can put the the mobilization for justice number, that was that would be amazing. Um, okay, um, there was a question which I think um, uh, may be relevant to to a broader number of people about the relationship between temporary supported housing and permanent supportive housing. Um, so someone asked. When a temporary supportive housing provider wants a tenant to move on, is it the tenant's sole responsibility to find permanent housing or does the level two housing provider have an obligation to help? And if a permanent placement is offered that the tenant doesn't like, is the tenant obligated to take it? And if the lease ends, does the tenant have rights as a holdover tenant? It's a lot of questions, but I think they all come together very well. So whoever wants to grab that. I thought I saw Kat nodding. Uh, I know that um, oh, something's up with the computer I'm on. Um, I know that um, when you're in a level two, um, part of the time you're there is working with a caseworker to help find your next placement, like what's supposed to be permanent housing. So you know, in an ideal world, the caseworkers that you're with are helping you prepare for the job, or not the job, but prepare for the housing interviews, looking into the next housing placements, um, sort of like that's part of what you're going to be doing while you're there. Um, so that is one of the, for one of the questions I saw in that chat, um, that is what the, um, the housing provider while you're there is going to be helping you transition out of that into the next placement, um, which may or may not be permanent. It may be another step up towards permanency. Um, it's um, one other thing that I've learned from other um, from another organization is that um, to, answer, or to, do, to address the question about if the tenant doesn't like it, is the tenant obligated to take it? There's a really good training that is um, learning how to look at an apartment um, or like a bedroom, if you're like looking into re renting a room, um, you know, how to look at it critically, how to critique it. Like, why do you not like it? And how to be able to present that to why you do not want to live there. Um, and like, if it's just simply because like, if you just say like, you know, no, I don't want to live there. You need to be able to have an answer as to why. Is it because the person that you are going to be living next door to was pounding the walls? Is it because there is a hole in the bathroom and you could smell the mold or see the mold? Is it because there were dead cockroaches and dead mice in the kitchen and that's why you do not want to live there? So you need to be able to have the answers and the reasons and be able to present them professionally as to why you turned down that placement. Was it because it was in a bad neighborhood, but then we have to define bad? Was it because like, you know, it was right at a subway station and you could hear the subway while you were on touring the apartment. So you knew that it was going to be too loud for you or it was going to be too triggering for you. So you need to be able to have like positive reasons for why that placement is not good for you and your health. Instead of just saying no, if you say no, then basically you're going to be put on the, what we have heard is you're going to be put on the bottom of the list and they're not going to be intending to move you out or you're not going to, like, that's what we have heard unofficially. Um, but there are ways to learn how to work with the, 
work with the partner or work with the provider to like towards where you want to go. Um, and I haven't heard, I don't know much about the last question about if the level two lease ends, does a tenant have rights as a holdover tenant? That one I'm not familiar with. Yeah, I'll just briefly say that MFJ's legal position is yes. Even after the transitional housing program has followed whatever internal discharge or termination procedures they have in place, it's our legal position that they still need to take someone to housing court. However, a lot of providers bully or intimidate residents into leaving voluntarily. Um, and some housing, uh, transitional housing providers will just lock the, the building door. Um, it's somewhat a gray area in the housing court right now, but our position is yes, you still have the right to court process. Thank you both. Um, so we still have a few minutes. Um, so I see Abby has a hand up um, and, and has a question. So um, I'm gonna ask her to unmute. Hi, thank you so much. Um, this was such a wonderful presentation. I really learned a lot. Um, I feel like Kat just answered a lot of my questions, but basically, so, and I wrote this in the chat. So I work as a, a residential counselor at a level two um, community residence, and it's supposed to be transitional, um, but we have a lot of leeway and we hardly ever, like it's happened one or two times in the past many years, like kick ever, anyone out. Um, we've had people here since 2003. Um, and even the, um, I'm taking on a new client today who has been here for over a decade and she's demonstrated coping skills that she's ready to move on to um, in a, the, the ATP program, which is apartment. Um, but every time it's brought up, she gets very fearful. She pulls back. She's like, no, I'm comfortable here. Like, it's just very hard for her. So I'm wondering from you guys, like who have gone through um, supportive housing and the transitions and worked with counselors and caseworkers, like what things have they done that have helped you ease the transition or any coping strategies, any kinds of conversations that have helped you get through difficult transition time? Because I mean, transition is hard for anyone, let alone someone living with a severe and persistent mental illness in a community residence. So I was wondering if you guys had any thoughts on that. Yeah, um, hi, Abby, how are you? Hey, Michael, uh, I'm good, how are you? Good. Um, yeah, I just wanna say that uh, in my program, I've been in my program for four, 17 years, I believe. And um, it was very helpful because when I was in the um, initial coming out of the psychiatric hospital, um, I lived with two roommates. And um, so I was in, I guess, that department treatment kind of um, uh, stage for two years. And it was pretty, um, you know, I had a case manager that would come three times a week. Um, they looked to make sure that I was taking my meds and keeping my, my areas of my apartment clean and things like that. And to transition into the independent scattered site unit that I'm in now that I've been in since about 2008, it was a little scary to be honest, to go from uh, so much structure to, to having um, only once a month meetings with, with a case manager. And um, there were some wonderful things that were put into place, but um, I think that it was just uh, one thing that I think really, really helps is we, we have a monthly tenants meeting um, at our, our program and um, we, we are, remote right now, but usually they're in person. And so it's a really great chance to go and meet up with um, other people kind of feeling there's, we also do socialization events and it, there's a feeling of family in the um, organization. And um, I think that's, that's was there from the beginning. So I, I know a lot of the people uh, now since 2008 and it was a really, it really helped in the transition um, going from more structured to independent. So I don't know if that helps at all. Yeah, definitely. That's great. I'm really glad that helped you. Thank you for sharing. Sure. Um, 
Thanks for your question, Abby. Um, yeah. Okay, I see uh, Denise also has a hand raised and then uh, a phone number starting with 332 has a hand raised. Um, so we've got five minutes left. So I think we've got definitely time for two more questions and then we'll see if we have time for any additional questions after that. Um, okay, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, perfect. I just wanted to make sure. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you for the very informative. I've, I haven't gotten this information anywhere. So I just want to say thank you to everyone. Um, my situation is a little complicated and I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'll keep it to one question for now. Um, in my building, it is supported. By, um, they did an inspection without providing um, a notification ahead of time. And that for me, you know, without going into my diagnosis, that was very traumatic to know that someone had come into my um, room without um, notification. Um, they also have tried to overcharge me what's on the lease, but you know, just for now, um, for context, just that that one question. Um, I've asked before, asked a couple of people how can I report that. I tried talking to the um, building management assistant director, building director assistant director. They they didn't care at all. Um, so I just wanted to ask that question, like how how would I report something like that? Yeah, thank you for that question. I can field it briefly. So um, I would recommend, even if it feels like a futile exercise, that you ask your supportive housing provider to provide a copy of their grievance policy and their grievance form if they have one and submit it, even if you don't have any confidence that anything will come of it. In addition, you should call the New York State Office of Mental Health Customer Relations Line and make a complaint. I do want to acknowledge, however, that these situation, in these situations, and you are not the only one who's had this experience, unfortunately, it could be very difficult to find satisfactory redress. Um, and that's in great part because there's no way to undo the harm that's already been done by that invasion into your home space. And so I, I just want to acknowledge that up front. But yes, um, request a copy of the grievance procedure and the grievance form, complete it and submit it, and then also contact the New York State Office of Mental Health and make a complaint. Thank you, Sandra. Um, I think I'm putting in re uh entering the link that you put in earlier for the omh complaint line let me know if that's the incorrect link um so that's in the chat as well um okay i'm gonna go ahead so the phone number starting with 332 i'm gonna go ahead and ask you to unmute um i'm gonna try that if it doesn't work you might need to press star six since you're on a phone i'm gonna try this Let's see. Yeah, try. Oh, there we go. We should be able to hear you now. Hi. Yes, it finally kicked in. <laughs> okay, thank you. I found this whole uh, uh, workshop very invigorating because I've been fighting my supportive housing uh, provider for a long time. I have two quick questions. I heard what you said about the wraparound uh, services, which is really the case management. Uh, and isn't that the whole crux of being in supportive housing? Um, so uh, be, I have here the list of everything that was said, you know, uh, uh, vocational education, require, uh, recovery, medication, benefits, mental health care, legal support, uh, et cetera. But what I want to know is, is there a set of set number of hours, days that they, my provider is obligated to give me? So for example, I used to get a call once a week. How are you? 
uh, you know, did you hear the news, blah, blah, blah. But once I started asking, I need this, I need that, then, oh, we'll look into it. Oh, I'll have to ask somebody else about this. Uh, when COVID hit, it got even worse because now they're not on site. So they call you and you'll say, hey, can I get a home health aid? And they, uh, I've been told, I'll have to figure this out. Uh, I can give your number out. No, I don't want you to give my number out. Uh, don't you have years of experience as a case manager when somebody else has asked you for home health aid? Uh, you know, what agencies do you work with? What kind of questions should I ask? Turns out, for example, uh, I have regular Medicaid and Medicare, and they uh, all these uh, agencies for the health home health aid want you to switch to a managed care. Uh, I didn't know that, so I'm in limbo right now. But my question, again, is, is there anything that says the case management, management should be once a week, uh, there has to be follow-up, which there never is. Uh, it has to be results-driven. Uh, there has to be accountability. Uh, any comment on that? Kat or Michaels, or do you want me to field this? Up to you. I think everyone's different because like my caseworker, um i found out they're supposed to do it at least once a month but they don't and that they don't have a background in social work or psychology they have an mba um and that they're only trained to enter data in a computer um so i think and that's not what i knew when i signed up for supportive housing i thought they were actually exactly. trying to know how to be supportive exactly um, and so that's one of the things that I hope to work on in the future is to like to have supportive housing actually know how to be supportive. <laughs> um, it's to, to us, it makes common sense. But before COVID, what they did is they hired unpaid social work interns to come play board games for an hour once a week. That was mm -hmm. how they were justifying being supportive housing. That was what they did. They were like, well, that's how we're offering support to you guys. Um, so, so it's I basically, some, sorry. I'm sorry, let me, cause I know it's the last few minutes and I really wanna know about something else also. Uh, so it, it's right now as it stands, there is nothing on paper that says, this is what being supportive housing means that the case manager has to do this for so many hours, nothing has been um, put on paper from what you know? No, you're absolutely correct. In theory, the support services are been supposed to be responsive to someone's needs. Mm -hmm. um, but in practice, the, the failure to document what support services are available or required means that many tenants don't get any support services at all. Okay, now, and so I'm sorry, go ahead, because I, I need to move on to the next part. I was just going to add that uh, supportive housing providers should have developed a service plan with you. And so that provides some goalposts for what they should be doing or what you should be working on together. But in my experience, many tenants don't even uh, get copies of the so-called service plans. Exactly. That means nothing. Um, and so there's a regulatory agreement. I thought it was all throughout supportive housing, whoever the provider might be. Okay. So I know uh, for years, perhaps over a decade, I've been going to various places and I don't want to name them because some of them are on this call. So, um, the, nobody wants to talk about the regulatory agreement. Nobody wants to read it. Uh, I just had a, a third holdover regarding the lease. And the judge even said, I don't want to read the lease. Uh, excuse me. I don't want to read the regulatory agreement. 
Uh, I don't want to do the four corners on it, which to me is a legally saying, I, I don't want to be thorough about it. And uh, so I'm not going to judge what it says on the regulatory green. Okay. So uh, is, is anybody involved in knowing what the regulatory agreement, uh, a lot of it is legalese. So does anybody read it and uh, nowadays and, and, uh, and interpret it? Yeah, just briefly in response, different supportive housing programs are subject to different regulatory agreements. Okay. Um, it, it can be complicated. It sounds like you already know what agreement applies to your housing, which is great. A mm -hmm. lot of tenants don't know what agreements apply to their housing. And the, the new law that Michael Korn mentioned earlier, Local Law 15, which was just passed earlier this year and comes into yes. effect on May 9th, that will ensure that all tenants in permanent supportive housing get a notice with that specifies the funding sources for their supportive housing, as well as any applicable regulatory agreements. So if you are a, a tenant in permanent supportive housing, stay tuned um, and keep an eye out for that notice. Your provider should be issuing one to you. And then for the caller, I can just say, I'm sorry that the, the judge didn't look at what you provided. Um, just like with any institution, uh, the quality of care you receive depends hugely on the individual assigned to your respective case. And I'm sorry that they didn't give that regulatory agreement the attention that, that it was due. May I ask one more last question? The lease that I'm being offered for renewal, because I've been here over a decade, um, doesn't indicate that this is supportive housing, and it certainly doesn't indicate that this is project based Section 8. So they're giving me a lease that they say that HPD is approving of. I have for the three holdovers try to get HPD to show up. I'm certainly not going to go out of my way to make them show up. I've been expecting the um, the landlord to request that their law department come in from HPD, and they also back out at the at the last minute. The the, the landlord also doesn't uh, appear. It, it appears to be a bully tactic. Oh, we're going to call HPD, who's going to back us up on what these numbers are, which are like five hundred dollars away from what it should be. Uh, but then the time comes. And so I even reminded the judge, I said, okay, well, you know, isn't HPD supposed to be here? Because the landlord signed a paper that said that uh, that's one of their witnesses. And the judge just said, oh, well, um, you know, this is not a trial. So no, I'm not waiting for any witnesses. Uh, thank goodness uh, all three times it's been in my favor. But again, can I demand that my lease indicates that it's supportive housing? and that it's section based, uh, pr excuse me, uh, project based section eight. Can I demand that? So again, great question. And I would say that's actually going to be addressed by this local new New York City local law 15, which is going to require after May 9th that supportive housing providers, your supportive housing uh, provider, if you live in permanent supportive housing, issue a notice of supportive housing tenants rights and on that notice your provider is going to be required to put um, funding streams the regulatory nature of the housing which includes if there's hpd project-based involvement so stay tuned after may 9th and do connect with shout and let us know what your experience is because we want to be monitoring the rollout and implementation of this local law 15 to make sure the city gets it right i i definitely would want membership is that how you uh, shout operates by by membership or how do you um, I don't know, make up the body of Shout. Uh, so Shout's, con so I think it is membership based and the contact information is going to be, um, maybe we can uh, say the, the email address and the phone number one more time before we wrap up, but it is going to go out 
um, in the slides that are going to be emailed out to to everyone. Um, and unfortunately, we do have to um, to wrap it up at this point, just for the sake of time. I know there are a couple of hands raised, and I'm so sorry we're not able to get to your questions uh, this evening. Please do feel free to reply to the um, thank you and additional resources email that you get. Um, I will get those. Uh, I will get any replies that you send. So if you have any um, follow up questions, you can um, reply to that email. Um, and uh, the the cop the PowerPoint slides will be emailed out to everyone who registers. So if you got an email with the link to this Zoom, you will get that recording and you will get those slides. So no worries about that. Um, and yeah, can we just say uh, the shout contact information one more time before we wrap up? Yes, so that is contact shout nyc at gmail.com, contact shout nyc at gmail.com, and the number is 856 403 8569. That's a voicemail number. So you will be leaving a voicemail and someone will return your call. Okay. Thank you everyone so much. Um, I'm sorry to have to, to wrap this up, but I want to be respectful of everybody, everybody's time. Thank you so much to our presenters um, and, and for all of the questions and, and information, questions you answered and information that you shared. Um, thank you everyone who's stuck around uh, past our end time to hear more of this information. Um, thank you to our interpreters. Um, and yeah, shout out to shout as uh, as Kim said. Um, uh, we we hope to hold more of these trainings. Um, so thank you all for being here. <laughs>